I was living with it. And while, while I couldn't be honest, I, I really didn't have a chance to get out of, of uh, this behaviour because I had to keep going and going. While there was always a chance I could get, you know, if only I can do this, then I'm happy to stop. But it, 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 it was never enough. My name's Keith and I'm a uh, recovering compulsive gambler. I guess it, you know, normal, normal childhood. My father died when I was when I was uh, a baby, so I grew up as in a one-parent family. So I was different from everybody else in that respect. I always felt different as a child. So I did want that father figure. I wanted to be like other children and. And that's how, that's how I really do have this memory of wanting to be somebody else when I went to friends' houses and all this, you know, and that. I even remember somebody making fun of me, you know, I've got a dad and you haven't. I, I never wanted to leave home. No, I couldn't believe, you know, there was old, older uh, brothers and sisters that wanted to leave home. Not me, I wanted to be, stay with mum forever. Very, very close bond to my mum. I remember playing uh, the fruit machine down the chip shop was my first, uh, real first memory of gambling was uh, stealing coins out of my mum's handbag, going to play the fruit machine down the chip shop. Mum, mum used to come and uh, find me down the pier at 10 o'clock at night, something like that, 10, 11 o'clock, whatever. You know, I wouldn't dream of my children being out any, any times there and they're a lot older than I was. The, the, these piers that I sought out or whatever, I, I always felt I was a step up from them. Um, but I think looking back now, I probably probably wasn't very intelligent. Just the people that I was with actually thought I was intelligent. With all my friends, you know, we'd go out drinking on a Friday night, two litres a side or whatever. There's 15, 16 year olds. Um, I, had a low, I had a low threshold of alcohol, so I couldn't drink as much as other people. I would always sort of drink till blackout since I can remember really 18, 19, going to the clubs, always drinking till blackout. For me it was drinking, just drinking wine normally, but it was it was every day. It could be a couple of bottles. It, it was enough for me to, to understand that I had a problem. I, I could not cope until, unless I was getting drunk, um, which, was, which was escaping from my, me, you know. It was my way to escape because I'd, I'd sort of done so much damage with my credit. Couldn't get a bank account, so I had a sort of Abbey National Passbook, and I remember my wages went into that. And I remember looking at it one day, like the, the salary had gone in at the end of the month, it was only about 900 quid. The salary went in, and I'd go down and draw out from the hole in the wall, and I, and I remember, you know, go, going back in there, and it, and it was, so I've got, you know, I've got 900 quid to last for the month, go and do 300 quid, okay, I've got 600 probably survive and for and before I know it that same day I'll be left with 150 quid to last me the month and then I'll probably go and blow that the next day I remember that and then I had a bit of an idea how to scam, scam money from from my employer and the guy that I I, we, we, I did this with uh, he he got all nervous and whatever and, and he actually came clean to the police come clean and uh, sort of dobbed us both in um, it wasn't an awful lot of money in the grand scheme of things, you know, probably 800, 800 pounds, something like that, but it was the principle of it. And I, and I remember getting escorted out of the office in front of all my colleagues, you know, by the police. Went along to the court and ended up with a suspended sentence for um, theft, I think I was charged with. But it didn't last long, you know, I was back in action soon. Uh, my granddad died, he left me. 60, 65,000 pounds, something around about that figure. And over that time, when I was, so I was unemployed, had loads of money in the bank, and uh, gone back to gambling. And that over these next sort of four, five, six months, I slowly dwindled away all this money that my granddad had worked all his life for. After it had all gone, I, w I had no home, I was sleeping on a friend's sofa. Um, Everything gone, everything. And, I, and all the family must have known what was going to happen. I didn't know, but they all knew. Um, 
And I remember mum calling me and I was laying on the sofa, everything had gone and I didn't want to answer the phone. And that, that was the lowest point, I think. That was the lowest because that's when I really did consider suicide for the first time. That I can't carry on living like this, there was no escape. I had a family living with me and and everything else. And, and things unraveled, you know, you could say it's because of the gambling. It was, you know, due to my behaviour, it wasn't down to the gambling. Uh, I tried to stop gambling before and it didn't change me as a person because I did nothing apart, apart from stop. I didn't change anything about me or my behaviour. So I stopped the gambling and couldn't understand why um, why nothing changed for me. It got worse in, 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 in some respects, things got worse. I remember going away on a stag do, for example. Uh, first day out, went out. I popped. We everybody popped in the betting shop to put a football coupon on. I stayed in, then lost everything I had for the stag do. Um, you know, that, that was one example. You know, having to go back. Oh, can you lend us a few quid? And everybody, you know, was making fun of me for what I'd gone and done. And uh, you know, everybody knew what I was like. I was either in action. Or I was looking at ways to find the money to be in action. Or if I would lost money that was somebody else's, looking for ways to get the money to pay that back. Always looking for, you know, it's either winning, losing, being in action, or trying to find the money to be in action. And that, that's just how it was for me. That's how it was. I can look back in my own, my own experience. Barriers weren't enough. Putting an exclusion on down the betting shop. I drive. I would drive 20 miles to go and have a bet at another betting shop that I wasn't excluded from. There's, there's, there's ways to get around any barriers you put in place. It was, it was complete, complete insanity what I was doing, um, and I can look back now and see, see that it was insane at the time. It was just normal. There was nothing more important to me than putting a bet on, changing the way I felt for a few hours, and and it, it gave me a buzz. It really did give me a buzz. When I was gambling, I was a slave to it, 100%. If I wasn't, if I wasn't in action, I was looking at ways of finding money to be in action. Would you ever gamble again? That's a good question. Here's a good question. Um, I'd like to think. I would like to say no. I would really like to say no. See, it's my intention that I'm never going to place another bet. Uh, do I believe that? Yes. Can I, can I be, uh, can I be blase about it? No, no way. Any memory or good, good thing that I ever think about having, having with gambling, immediately I quash thinking what's going to happen, what are the consequences of having one bet. It could be a lottery ticket, could be a scratch card, anything that will set me off. So it's quite easy, stay away from the first bet and I won't have another one.